what was your like relationship with patience over time? Have you always been super patient? I'm not patient today. You, you would, what would you say? What would you say is the the value that helped you get through it? I understand people, and I know how we think. And I know even from my own experience, like even though I talk about my winning mindset, a winning mindset doesn't mean that you don't fear. It doesn't mean that you don't get worried and nervous. I do. I just know how to push through anyway. So I know that you'll agree, enjoying myself while at work is the vibe that I'm trying to be on. So I wanna invite you guys to Sidebar ATL here in Atlanta, Georgia. Sidebar, on top of the good food and live music, they have three different experiences. That means you can join me in the garden room, in the gold room if you wanna try the top of the line hookah, and they also have the dungeon where I hear what happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon. So it's the perfect mix if you're here on business or you wanna blow off some steam after work, you can meet me at Sidebar ATL so that you can have a little bit of dinner and then turn up afterwards if that's your jam. So check us out, 79 Poplar Street here in downtown Atlanta, or you can call 678-800-0741. Let's get it, work and play at the same time, right? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Work and Play Podcast. I'm your host, Arielle, and I am so, 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 so glad that I get to introduce Miss Donnie Wiggins to you guys. Now, first of all, I don't, we had not had one one-on-one -on -one coaching session before I made $12,000 off of my investment with working with you. And I think that that speaks a lot to your mind, mm -hmm. your work ethic, and maybe even understanding like what you do in your craft. So one, I'm excited to talk about like your, your like brain and how you actually help other people become entrepreneurs. But the other part is you actually have a similar background where you came from corporate America. You learned about how to create a business and I would love to get your story on the podcast. So Let's go. Oh, I am excited to be here. So you are the first person that has participated in any of my programs that I have sat down to talk to. Really? Yes, ma'am. I am honored. Yes, ma'am. So let's get it. Let's I'm go. So proud of you. <laughs> I'm extremely happy. So those of you guys who don't know this wonderful lady, please introduce yourself. I am Donnie Wiggins. I am a business development strategist, AKA a business coach. I help entrepreneurs grow and scale their businesses. And I have special programs also specifically for uh, people who want to be coaches, consultants, and course creators. If you believe you know a thing or two, like Miss Arielle Young, you go out and you create your own programs and I teach you how to make a lot of money from it. Wonderful. Now, the first thing that I that really resonated with me before I even got a chance to have really a true conversation with you was champions don't accept obstacles as defeat. Mm -hmm. They believe in their ability to figure it out. That's so if we were to jump into your story, how did that come about? Why was that the first thing that you decided to resonate with us? Um, shout out to the Six Figure Accelerator program. <laughs> I love it. So that means a lot. Champions don't accept obstacles as defeat because my whole life, I have felt like a winner, right? Um, of course, we go through phases where we feel like we're losing or you feel like a loser. But when you're thinking about and those are just seasons. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about the grand scheme of your life, like my whole life, I have felt like a winner, like just me claiming who I was destined to be. But throughout the journey of my life, I've had obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And I can think of so many conversations that I had with the people that I had access to early on. I don't have the same access to the same, you know, I didn't have the people that I have access to today, I didn't have access to back then. Mm -hmm. And I can think of the people who were giving me like my career advice and my money advice early on, and I'm talking like 20 years ago. And the conversation would often be something like, um, well, you know, that happened, so you should just probably go get a job, or that happened, so you should adjust your, your expectations, or you should think more realistically. Like, I, I heard a lot of realistic thinking conversations, mm. and I remember, you know, I was talking to people who I, but they, there were people that I respected. So I couldn't always say the rebuttal that I wanted to say, but it was always in my mind, like, okay, you think so, watch watch and see it was a watch and see and for me it was like no matter what 
I do not accept defeat. No matter what, I am going to figure it out or figure it out. One of my greatest affirmations that carry me through life is that I believe in my ability to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's what a champion does. I love it. Yeah. Honestly and truly, I think that I've had to come into like let that small voice in the back of my mind mm -hmm. become the bigger voice in the back of my mind. Because oftentimes we do get uh, advice and wisdom from people we respect, but we don't necessarily know which way to go. So because you have always like been a winner, you're essentially not just teaching entrepreneurship, but you're teaching like a winner's mindset. Yeah, and winning is a mindset. So it doesn't matter how many losses you actually take. Mm -hmm. Winning is a mindset. It's like when you tell children, you know, fall down two times, get up three. Mm -hmm. That's a winning mindset. And I was that person. Like there are there are people who just accept losses. And I don't. I understand them and I will pick a loss apart and figure out, OK, that's where I made the wrong turn. Let's bring this back around and do it again. And I think uh, one of my greatest assets and even what I teach people is I give them. I'm a business coach, right? Mm -hmm. But it's always mindset. You said it yourself. You've gone through one of my programs mm -hmm. and it starts off straight mindset. And it's important to do that because you have to help people sometimes see the winner in themselves and believe in it. And that it's not just mumbo jumbo, but winning is a mindset. It's not about any amount of money that I've ever made. It's not about, you know, any success that I've ever had. It's my mindset. Mm -hmm. So I remember, Ariel, when I lost my house to foreclosure. Um, I lost everything, actually. My car is to repossession, my house to foreclosure, single mom. I just uh, ended a, a, an engagement with my daughter's father. And I remember just I just lost my job. I had nothing, right? Mm -hmm. I was making all this money, but I didn't save my money. Um, and so when the recession hit back in 2008 to 2010, I couldn't make it more than six months, right, financially. And I remember moving back in with my mom finally, and she walked past my bedroom one day and I'm in there and I'm on my bed and I'm jamming. Like I'm listening to my music. I think I had my iPod and I'm just <laughs> doing what I do. And my mom walks past my room and she comes back and she says, how could you be so happy? Like you don't have everything going, like all this stuff going on. And I'm like, Am I supposed to just be sad and depressed and unhappy? Like being stressed out and unhappy isn't going to change the situation. Me staying upbeat and in a positive winning mindset helps me to see the light that's on the other side of the tunnel. Are you still trying to get a leg up on your entrepreneurial career? Now I told you about the morning meetup, the community that was created for the betterment of entrepreneurship. And we are cooking up some really cool things. Now here's the thing. If you join today, you can actually get in for 60% of the original price. So if you join today, all you have to do is download the app and I provided the link below so that you can join us. We have community, we have a book club and it's the largest group that meets every single day, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. to literally get a head start on entrepreneurship. So if you're still trying to grow, you don't know what your business is going to be, but you know you want to be an entrepreneur, this is the community for you. So check out the morning meetup, click the link below, download the app and join us today. Hmm. And I teach from that. And the other thing is, <clears throat> like you said, like the, the environment of other people, like making you realize you, one of the things that a lot of successful entrepreneurs say is like, you kind of have to be delirious. You have to believe you have to like really put yourself in an in an environment or encapsulate yourself in a way that no one like you cannot see the reality. So I think that's really awesome that you really create this this um, environment in your mind to not be deterred by certain things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, there was something else that you said um, that reminded me of like this Erica Badu song. She goes, um, oh, hey, I made a wrong turn back there. So yep. you said that um, even if you do go down the wrong direction or if you, even if you do make a, you know, a failure, that is okay when it when it comes to all the build businesses that you've created or even the feedback that you've taken was there ever a time that you would describe something as like make it like what would a wrong turn look like for you of all the things that you've done i have had a million wrong turns like i've had so many wrong turns i could go on and on all day about that um <laughs> one of my wrong turns uh was not managing my money properly, right? Like making money and not really having a good relationship with money. 
So I didn't make good decisions, you know, about money. Uh, I made wrong turns with certain partnerships mm -hmm. in business, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, I made wrong turns in saying yes to opportunities just because there was a check attached to it. Um, and not necessarily that it was a bad opportunity, but it was a, it, it was an opportunity that delayed my own my own progress toward my own goals. So, you know, being in situations where, you know, I can remember being involved in a network marketing company uh, because that's kind of where I started building in the MLM space. I can remember being involved in a particular network marketing company and making well over six figures in that company and just one day sitting down having the epiphany that if I keep doing this, I will never get to the bigger thing. And it wasn't about the bigger money, it was about the bigger fulfillment for me, mm -hmm. purpose. But I was attached, I created this lifestyle around this income that I generated that was super easy to do. Um, and it was definitely a wrong term because it, it delayed what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah, but we can yeah. definitely, I would say, um, and I would assume that you learned a lot mm -hmm. about creating businesses, mm -hmm. about running businesses, about even being successful. So let's talk a little bit about like the buildup of how you actually became able to like express your purpose. One of the posts that you said on Instagram was like, I'm super blessed that I get to wake up and dress how I want to and still impact others. Mm -hmm. And I think that embodies work and play, honestly. Mm -hmm. What was the first business that you started after leaving corporate? Well, actually, let's go into corporate. You spent a little bit of time in corporate America. Mm -hmm. Like out of all of the influences, were you ever thinking about entrepreneurship like early on or was it I have probably desired to be an entrepreneur since birth like for real mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean it was it was instilled in me early on I grew up watching my mom and my dad like do entrepreneurial things my mom had businesses you know um, left and right things she would always try she would always try stuff so I grew up seeing that and then too, she did that in a long, in alongside having a corporate career, but her job allowed her to work from home, right? Mm -hmm. So I grew up with my mom there all the time. She's there because she worked from home and it didn't really feel like my mom had a job. She would work, you know, and she had important things to do, but she was there. So for me, as we started to get older, I know my first job, I think was, it was either Six Flags or my, my job at New York. You worked company. at Six Flags? Absolutely. What did you, what Shout was your job? I DJ's. I was, I was, <laughs> the, I was a manager at DJ's restaurant in, um, at Six Flags. I didn't start as a manager. I, I got promoted, but uh, cashier and food mm -hmm. prep. All the things. Mm -hmm. So that was like fun because it was around my peers and I worked in the mall. I just can't remember which job I did first. Mm -hmm. I think it was Six Flags. Those things were fun because I got to work around my peers. But then when I got into corporate America, um, you know, young, I started really young on the back of internships in college. And these companies would just want to keep me because I performed well. Anyway, I started to see like all these stressed out adults who didn't seem happy. And, you know, I just remember, you know, moments where I would need a day off and I'm like, oh, you got to ask. Mm hmm. You know, or I would hear locker room conversation or what is it, break room conversation about somebody's upset because they can't attend something for their child because they, they can't find coverage. Right. And that's not what work looked like to me. Look, work looked like what my mom did, like from home in front of her computer, making a couple calls, the end. So I never loved the physical activity of getting up and getting dressed to go to work. I loved my career choices, but getting up, <laughs> getting dressed, mm -hmm. and I would literally in job interviews ask, well, how do you track productivity and time, specifically time? And if there were a time clock, I could not. Mm -hmm. It felt like slavery to me. What gave you the insight to ask that question about how do they track pro productivity? Because I hate time clocks. I hated time clocks. Mm. And it came down to uh, really one of my flaws is, you know, at that time, especially I wasn't the most punctual person. Right. 
And so I was always the number one employee, the number one person on the team. I'm outperforming everybody, but I'm constantly getting dinged because I'm running three minutes late. Like my time clock is consistently three minutes late, seven minutes late. And it was like, you know, one job specifically, I was the number one in every area except for that. And I'm all this work that I'm doing, all the millions of dollars that I'm making in this company, you find the time to come and talk to me about being three minutes late consistently when such and such isn't performing or taking off, you know, completely. And I was so annoyed because I was the type of employee like I didn't understand eight hour work days. It doesn't take me eight hours to do this job. Mm. Like, can I leave? You know, I just I've never understood the logic like. You know, if you are growing up in school, if, if the teacher gives you an assignment or a test, you have the whole 60 minutes or 50 minutes to do this test. If you finish in 15 minutes, they're going to tell you, hey, you can get a pass to go to the library. Right. You can get a pass to join the others in recess or you can sit there and you can read a book. They don't make you keep looking at the test for 50 minutes. That's right? real. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> now, if the other kids need the whole 50 minutes, right. you take the whole 50 mm -hmm. minutes. But if you finish fast, you get to move on to something else. So that's, I was always the fast finisher. So at work, it was like, am, is it me? Am I slow? Does it really take eight hours to run to do this job now as you talk about your flaws what was it that was your strength and I'm sure you have many strengths but as you thought about like cultivating your strengths early on what was that strength that made you good at what you do my number one gift is communication mm. I have I have a gift and it was something that I did not realize was a gift until uh, I started to get I started to, to get older. My mom always told me it was my gift. One day you're going to do something where you have to communicate. She thought I would be a journalist, a news reporter. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Mind. You're my mom. You're supposed to say this stuff. But it wasn't until um, really when I started building business, when I started. So early on, like getting jobs, I knew that if I could get the interview, if I get the in-person interview, the job is done. Mm -hmm. I have the gift of gab, right? But even as in network marketing, I'm now building teams and I'm working with other people. This is different and new for me. People are coming into my environment and I would, you know, there's a script. And one of the things are, you know, to kind of paint the picture of the vision of your life. And it was then that I realized how effectively I communicated and how clear my communication was because I then started to engage with so many people who had a struggle. They they could not express themselves mm -hmm. verbally or in writing. And I'm like, OK, it really is a gift. And then and then also the day and age of social media, uh, Facebook before Instagram was a thing. I would just blog my thoughts on Facebook or I would write about scenarios. I would write about a date or something I did with my daughter or what's going on uh, at the time I was opening a clothing store, what's going on there. And people would constantly say, I can literally see what's happening in your life. Mm, it was so through vivid. your words. It's so clear. Mm. And I'm like, maybe this is a thing. And I didn't I didn't chase communication intentionally. Mm -hmm. It just makes what I do more effective. Absolutely. And as I think about you as a business coach, I wonder what part of your mind makes you like a business coach, right? Because there's there's a part of even my brain where I think a super I super think in structure, but I enjoy living free and floating around on a cloud. Yeah. When it comes to create a communication at that's what probably makes you a business coach. But where did you get the structure, the organization, <laughs> the like logical side of yourself? That is so funny. So number one, time mm. and just maturity and growth. And I think um, my my ability to just try stuff is a reason, a huge part of the reason for my success. So I always talk about my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad for clarity is my stepfather who's been in my life since I was like four or five years old. And so he raised me. So I say I get everything that I am from my mom and dad. My mom is the free floater. When I was growing up, she was always late. Now she's two hours early for everything. So maybe one day, you guys, I'll get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> she's, it took her a long time, but now she's like early for everything. But at that time, my mom was always late. 
she was free energy. She worked from home. She was, you know, she dressed fabulously and she was gorgeous. And, you know, she's that, that's me. I get that from her. But my dad, my dad was, or is, and even just growing up, very structured, very organized, very, this goes here and this goes here and this is how we do it. But he, he like growing up was the person Critical thinking is a, is a, is a second gift of mine. Mm -hmm. And I get that from his leadership. Like if I sat at the table, I had to sit at the table and do my homework and then he would come in and review my homework. Or if I had an, a question, he'd come and sit at the table with me with my homework. And it wasn't just, you know, why, what is five times 10 or five times two or whatever the number is. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just going to say, hold up your fingers and count or do the math and you know, let me explain to you the theory behind. And I'd be like, oh, here we go with this stuff again. Like, I just cannot. No, 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 no. It's, you got to understand logically because when you're out one day in the field, I'm like, well, what field? What field am I going to be in? You know, he wanted me to be able to, I couldn't use calculators. I had to know how to figure it out. So here's the way that you could do it. But let me give you another way, because if you got to be quick on your feet, like this is the way your teacher wants you to do it. But in real life, this is how you're going to do it. Mm. And so I grew up with that. My dad uh, was an engineer. And so he had a very critically thinking mindset and he could see, like, you see the lamp. My major in college was chemical engineering. Yeah. You see this lamp, but I am looking at this lamp and I'm thinking about how it was put together to make it work that way and how we've got this clear vase, but yet we see nothing going through it. And, oh, that's how they ran the cord through. I see that. I see the details. Hmm. My brain works in chaos. Because I am always seeing everything that's going on. If you've ever seen, I think it's the movie The Matrix. Yeah. There's this scene with Neo and he's trying to escape. It's closer to the end. He's trying to escape the two brothers or the two who look alike. Mm -hmm. And there's this hallway scene where he's got to get to this phone. And they're cornered. They've cornered him at this point. And, you know, they're like, is he the one? Is he the one? And so he turns around and he looks. And it's that scene where he goes, but you can see like this computer data just going across this, like, in yes. his mind. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like just these numbers and calculations and he's going and doing all this thing. That's how my brain works. The best way to support the Work and Play podcast is by subscribing to the YouTube channel and by going to your favorite podcast player to subscribe and rate the Work and Play podcast. That's all you have to do. So if you are liking the Work and Play podcast, the content, the stories that we're sharing, and you know that this will help someone, go ahead and share the content to someone who could actually use it and help them on their journey to transition from corporate into entrepreneurship. Now let's get back into the episode. Critical thinking has always been a gift of yours. Mm -hmm. When did you notice that was a superpower? Um, I noticed it was a superpower recently, like within the last, um, maybe since 2015 or so. Mm. So it hasn't even been 10 years. And I noticed it before it was a flaw. Before I'd say, why do you overthink think or like think that. like this? Like, mm -hmm. because it, it showed up negatively. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to really use it. It showed up negatively, like, especially in dating and parenting, like I'll see something and I'm like, no, don't do it that way. Because if you do it that way, like I just see the three, four, five steps ahead. Mm -hmm. Like I get that you're literally just putting the water, the cup of water on the wooden table. But over time, what's going to happen is if you continue this habit, like that drip that's dripping, like over time, it's going to warp that. And mm. then I see it. So then it comes off like nitpicking, like, no, 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 don't do that. When really it's not, I don't care where you put the glass. I just don't want you to warp the furniture. And you're not thinking that far ahead because it didn't warp it today. But I know what's going to happen in three months, six months, 12 months. Mm -hmm. And so it used to be negative, right? Um, but then when I realized you will figure your way out of anything, the, I believe in my ability to figure it out comes from my gift of critical thinking. And I created that affirmation in 2020 mm. and it was there. Like I knew that I was great at critical thinking and I started to teach critical thinking, but it was in 2020 when I realized it was a superpower when we were going through the middle of the pandemic and 
my business, how it ran at that time was an immediate halt. Like we did meetings and we traveled and all kinds of stuff that stopped cold Turkey. There was no warning. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out when I, when I thought, you know, I was battling COVID Mm -hmm. at that time. And I had it really, really bad. I wasn't sure what was going to happen with my health. And all I could think about was if something happens to me, I have nothing in place that will continue to make money on its own Mm -hmm. for my parent, for my mom and for my daughter specifically. And I'm like, they'd be good for a year, but that's not enough, right? So I had to figure out how in quarantine with COVID, can I use the influence that I've built and the, the knowledge that I've learned and the experiences that I had, how can I use this and create something that my family can depend on. Mm -hmm. And I did, like, I just did. I did my whole course, that that course that you took. Yes. um, And the quotes that you quote from it, I recorded that in, so I live in a condo and my condo is glass um, and it's just a lot of glass and it's a lot of noise. You hear all the background noise and that's not fitting for a course. You can't have horns blowing and you know, whatever. So I had to figure out um, <laughs> I just thought of, about that, uh, reel that, go, that sound bite that's going around. I got to figure out how to get this money by tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I had to figure out how to get this course by tomorrow. Yes. Right. Um, I had to figure out how to insulate a space yeah. and I literally recorded that course, which is now my signature program in my bathtub. I... I think I showed y'all a picture of this. You did, in the bathtub, Mm -hmm. laying down. (laughs) Even what's even cool about it, you gave us a time lapse of like you sitting down, focusing on just building it. There was even a time where you like just kind of sat there to gather yourself and then got back to Mm -hmm. to getting it. So even you capturing that moment Mm -hmm. was very valuable, right? Because it was in essence, you not allowing that obstacle to stop you. When yeah. a lot of us could just be like, yo, I'll sit on the couch right now. Everything will be fine tomorrow. Yeah, no, it, it, it wasn't. I didn't know I would, you know, I panicked in that moment. I, again, like the COVID thing scared me. I had COVID, I had it really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and people <clears throat> kept sending me these stories of all these people who are dying from COVID. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I could really die from this. I had never felt so sick, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but I wanted to get this program done and out. I didn't even know that I would be here to release it. Like there were literally instructions with this on, this is what you do and this is who you need to give it to so it can be marketed and you know all this stuff. So I didn't really have much energy. I needed to be able to sit up but lounge, mm-hmm. but be in a soundproof environment, mm-hmm. which is why I'm like, I, so I started Googling how to, um, how to soundproof a home with a lot of windows or a space with a lot of windows. And I came across this young lady's video that said her hack was to go in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. So at first I'm like on the stool in my bathroom with my computer, my laptop on the counter. And I'm like leaned over and it's not comfortable. I can't, you know, I need to be. So I looked and I'm like, huh get in the bathtub I had my you know my bathtub tray and I said the first time I did a session or a segment for the course it came out very echoey so then I said how to soundproof a bathroom and then I came across another video that said get in the bathtub put blankets around the bathtub and pillows as many as you can and it creates like this this sound chamber Mm -hmm. yeah sound chamber Mm -hmm. And once I did that, it was up from there. Mm. And so maybe the first three weeks of the course was recorded that way. And then I got better, obviously. And, yeah. Yeah. Now the course quality is one thing. Um, and even like, well, the course quality is one thing, but it's the level of detail is the forethought. Um, it's even like the, um, like, I, I don't know how you would say this in a song, like it's ad living, but mm-hmm. like in a course you're like, yeah, now I know you're thinking. Yeah. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. dang, how did, I am thinking mm-hmm. that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how should I act? <laughs> right. I'm saying it like, yeah, that literally is what I needed. Cause a lot of times I think, you know, they say, um, over 80% of courses don't get completed, right? Mm-hmm. But as I think about the times when even I was like, oh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm going down the right path, there would be something you would say like 30 minutes in, I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> calm down, 
keep going. And even to the point where the first conversation I had on you with, on the phone was, um, oh, Ariel, you're an overthinker. And it was super, not judgmental, but uh, understanding. Yeah. I'm like, okay, she said, I'm an overthinker. This is probably a time when I'm overthinking. I can't help but think it took a lot of patience for you to be diligent about creating the course, for you to sit down and not, um, I don't have another word for it, but cut corners. That's another mm-hmm. word for on something that would literally be your legacy. What was your like relationship with patience over time? Have you always been super patient? I'm not patient today. You, you would, what would you say? What would you say is the the value that helped you get through it? So what I did with that course. So at the time, prior to the whole pandemic happening, mm-hmm. I was only a one on one business coach. So I worked with a lot of people, and it's not necessarily that I'm patient because I'm not patient. I have studied the psychology of people and I am understanding Mm -hmm. more than anything. Like, I know what you're thinking. I know this is going to get hard. I know you want to quit. I know right now you're second get. I know something else is going to come up and you're going to be confused. Mm -hmm. Because of my experience in working with so many people and back to my network marketing days, building organizations of thousands of people that I was responsible for helping to develop. Um, I understand people and I know how we think. And I know even from my own experience, like even though I talk about my winning mindset, a winning mindset doesn't mean that you don't fear. It doesn't mean that you don't get worried and nervous. I do. I just know how to push through anyway. So when I deal with people and I'm listening, I know how to tell you how to overcome this. I know how you feel right now. I know how you feel. I know how your fear is paralyzing you. Your worries are suffocating you. Mm -hmm. I get, I've been there. Yeah. Let me help you get to the other side. And so when I put the course together, my goal was, okay, I want to specifically put a course together to teach people to do what I do. Even though I can coach and develop you in just about any business model, this course is for people who do what I do. How would I coach somebody? How have I coached? somebody and I believe that my course wins and does you know and it's so impactful because it wasn't just standardized information that was based on a curriculum. It was like my real experience of, okay, I know what happens when people get to this part. So let me put it in the course and mention it. That's why you felt like I was talking to you. Mm -hmm. I know who my audience is. I know what you've experienced because the people that I work with on an intimate level like that are a mirror image of me and my experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I'm getting you at a place that I was at before. I can help you get through it. Mm, And it does, you do it really, really well. And the proof is in the pudding. If they had like some type of a award ceremony for courses, I would definitely, (laughs) I would vote you in there. So you guys gotta check it out. uh, Cause it's it's really amazing. Um, I think about some of the courses that have, that I have purchased and I see the quality, the level of, quality is one thing, right? When Mm -hmm. the visuals look great, Mm -hmm. but when the level of thought is put into it, it's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. Yeah, and and I'm glad you said that the visuals and everything looking great. When I put my course together, it was just me. And I am not, I have vision and I can tell you visually how I want something done, but I am not like the person for that. But I put all this stuff together and because I knew like my course probably won't be the most beautiful, my my slides aren't gonna be the most beautiful slides. Mm -hmm. My information will be the best though. Like it's gonna be great. And my course isn't ugly. It just, could it have been prettier? Absolutely. I kept things very basic, very simple, and I wanted you to focus, but it was intentional. I could have hired someone. It was intentional. I didn't want you to be distracted by, oh wow, this is like super dope aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to get the information to go to work. Right, it goes back to that human behavior because Mm -hmm. a lot of times, when we are attracted to the glitz and glamour, we we don't get the transformation because it's the momentary excitement of the thing, yeah. right? And you're like, oh wait, but what did I learn? Yep. So I, I absolutely got it. You, you specifically said it in the course, um, you know, I don't want you to get distracted like this. I want you to keep it simple. Don't overthink <laughs> so many things. So I think that's actually really, really awesome. I was actually just thinking about, and this happens a lot sometimes as I'm thinking and I'm super excited about like what I'm, what I'm, what hap- what's happening. You, um, you also talk about the fun. It's about, I was thinking about um, you 
developing the fun part about it. Lord, if I don't forget this question. What is it? Tell me, girl. Let me get this. So one of the things that you do when you do a speech, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's going to come back to me. One of the things that you do when you do a speech, you will come on to some trap music. Right. And you might give us a little twerk. Matter of fact, when we get a sale, you do a twerk. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what? Yes, I do. <laughs> right. Super duper fun. That's it. You're super relatable, super fun. The things that you do also make people feel like, oh, Donnie could be a homegirl. She could be a friend. But you also mentioned, like, I'm one of your, the first students that you've been able to sit down and have a conversation with. And I think that speaks to a level of boundary or a level of, like, personal awareness that you have to have. Even mm-hmm. though you can be homegirl, mm-hmm. you also navigate um, relationships really well. Mm-hmm. What was it like for you to, like, be younger, right, <laughs> and, and still try to balance that business and personal early on? Um, early on... So I'll be honest, when I started in business early on, I was still at every party, Mm -hmm. every brunch, you know, I didn't miss anything, but I also didn't have the level of success that I have today. And the, the boundaries really didn't start coming until maybe, maybe 2019, where I saw myself now going to this different level and... I got to pull back. So my habits changed before 2019. Mm -hmm. When I first got started, like we're at everything and I'm committing to everything. My daughter having to go to all these parties. Yep. Because she would never suffer at the hand of my business, my friendships, my relationship, you know, whatever. Um, Then my habits just started to change. My actual likes and desires started to change. So I naturally just kind of distanced from parties and, you know, things like that. I became the brunch bestie and the travel, you know, friend and all those things. Um, But I I never missed a moment. It wasn't until maybe 2019 when I really started to see things having the potential to get even bigger Mm -hmm. that um, I don't it it was a self-imposed boundary because it wasn't something that I communicated. I just went into a hole and got to work. I just went into a hole, put my head down and got to work and gratefully my friends are the type of friends that know when Donnie is silent Donnie is brewing and we're gonna let her do what she does Mm -hmm. I don't have to you know there have been a couple of moments where I had to explain some stuff but for the most part like my friendships are if she texts back in 30 seconds, fantastic. But we know Donnie can take three days. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> Listen, give you give her the space. Did you ever feel like you had to, you said it was a couple times where you had to explain yourself. Mm-hmm. But even then, did you have to like lose friends or just kind of shift things drastically to be focused? Mm-mm. I don't believe in that whole um, thought process of getting rid of friends who don't see things the way you see things. I just don't. Mm. I have many friends that don't do what I do, that, um, you know, are still struggling in certain areas and they're still my friends. And they're still my friends because we have actual organic relationship and history and love built on things that don't include business, right? Um, The only time I will terminate a friendship is if it's damaging to me or that person if it doesn't feel good that's that's really it now I do believe that you need to incorporate new relationships so I will never tell people you need to get rid of your friends if you want to be successful all your friends are broke all your friends so what Mm -hmm. I was right there with them Mm -hmm. right but I do know that my friends when I was broke and I had to provide for my daughter and we were sharing Wendy's you know Uh, value meals like there was a time where I would eat the chicken nuggets I'm sorry my daughter would eat the chicken nuggets Mm -hmm. she didn't like french fries so I would eat the french fries and we would share a drink and I'm like hoping that she didn't eat all of the chicken nuggets so I could get a little piece of meat right like I do know that during that time I had friends those same friends you know that people would say why are you still in those friendship circles Those same friends made sure me and my daughter ate sometimes. Those same friends made sure that I had a good night out. Those same friends had sleepovers with my daughter just so I could have a break. You know, so those people, regardless of the level of success that they experience, will always be my sisters, period. 
that's non-negotiable. I stand on loyalty more than I stand on, like my loyalty means more to me than my success, mm -hmm. right? My success <clears throat> is going to happen because I'm a good person. Um, but on the other side of that, did I have to create new relationships that I could have higher level conversations with when it related to my business? For sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I believe everybody um, needs to do that. But relationships like, Friendships, it's like the last thing, at least for me, that you need to be stressing over when you're on your journey to success. Like if you got friends who want to party all the time, that doesn't mean that you have to. Right. It just, mm -hmm. You just don't. Mm -hmm. I grew up. I had friends who, you know, smoke weed all the time. We sitting right in the same area. I don't have to. Mm -hmm. So I am not as influenced by the behavior of the people that I organically enjoy being around. When it comes to a point where I no longer enjoy being around you. That's what makes my decision to distance myself, mm. not where I'm going. I got you. Yeah. You said relationships is not something to stress on. And I think that's important to delineate the difference between like, you know, that thought process that you have to let go of the people you care about so much in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, on the flip side of things, one of the things that I talk about in leaving corporate America is understanding who, what relationships you will be able to leverage as a business owner. So like when you talk about your story and I love how you you say like I had to listen to music when I went into the office because there came a point where you had to be like, listen, I'm going to get up out of here. <laughs> when you decided to leave, um, did you have a process? When you go back to that time where you just like, you were basically fitting a square peg into a round hole, yeah. right? Did you have a process to transition? Mm -hmm. Before I answer that, regarding relationships, mm -hmm. if you are in relationships that are unhealthy, mm -hmm. absolutely create distance. I, If you're in relationships where people are telling you that you can't, be successful, mm -hmm. where they are causing you to not pursue your dreams and they're not supportive, those relationships you absolutely create distance from, but not just because people think differently and they make different money than you. Yeah. Okay. So um, <laughs> my transition. So what I will say is um, I have been trying to be, and I, I had been trying to be an entrepreneur since I was 17 years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried everything. So it was always on the agenda. Like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but one day I'm going to own my own business. It's going to be successful and, you know, all this stuff. Um, I do remember on my last job, I was at that time involved. I was successful at that time in, in, corporate, in uh, network marketing. Mm -hmm. I had a successful corporate job in property management. And... I did not like the company that I worked for. I had been 13 years in that industry and now I'm on this job on this particular property and I could not stand the staff. Um, none of them, right? And ugh. so that was that. So I'm like, yo, I gotta figure a way to get this money by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That was really my mindset every single day. And I started my own property management company while I was still working this job. So I got my network marketing, I got my property management company, I have my job. And my property management company starts taking off because I had relationships over the, the years that I had been in the industry. I had great relationships and I was previously a real estate, a, a realtor. So I knew that industry still to this day, like the back of my hand, right? And luckily Atlanta had become Little Hollywood and all the film productions were coming in town. So I decided, even at that time, high ticket. Okay. I talk high ticket. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to manage properties where the rent is like, you know, six hundred dollars a month and all this stuff and I get ten percent of that. That's gonna be too slow of a build for me. I am looking to work and build relationships with um, production houses that have to house their cast, their Kevin Hart's, their Tom Cruises, and they're looking for penthouses and things where, you know, my commission could be five digits, mm, right? Yes. So I built that, I started to build that company and it just started to grow more and more and more. And then that took arms, right? They would come back and say, hey, I need, my client needs an assistant while he's in town filming this movie. Do you know anybody? Oh. Well, after I heard that a couple of times, I created an arm where I provided assistance and then I created an okay. arm where I provided housekeeping. And so um, for me, everything is about energy. It has to feel good. My job, on the other hand, while my businesses are flourishing, 
My job is becoming more and more and more stressful. And I think it started to, be, it was that way because again, I'm not gonna get stressed with you. Neither of us own this job, this company. Mm -hmm. And because I had other stuff going on, y'all can be stressed all you want. Now you're getting on my nerves a little bit, right? <laughs> you're making me wanna, the truth. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not gonna be stressed with you. And the fact that they couldn't get under my skin made it even worse of an environment for me. So when I left corporate America, um, I had already spent maybe two years building my businesses, building my businesses and building that to the point where it's far super, uh, surpassed the income that I was making on my job. So it was an easy transition. I can't say that I didn't miss the money because that money, that income, that salary was great too. I, I just had to do things differently. I had to change my habits. But That's I did build, like I leveraged, to me, <clears throat> my job was my entrepreneurial paid training. I got paid to learn things that would keep, help me to be developed and structured as an entrepreneur. So now when I talk about standard operating procedures or SOPs, um, when I talk about budgets and when I talk about, you know, organization and documentation and why it's so important, I didn't learn that as an entrepreneur. I learned those things as an employee. Mm. I incorporated them as an entrepreneur and now I teach it to other entrepreneurs. Yeah. You mentioned the, the difference between you doing what you do for like a $650 rent versus you doing it high ticket. The skill set that I think a lot of people don't necessarily recognize in themselves um, is like is a high value skill set. I'm trying to figure out what that was for you, because right now there's somebody who works a job and they thought they think if I can be an entrepreneur, I can go and do this thing for like $50, $50 an hour or $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. But the skill set that you had was worth more. I mean, you can do great at whatever ticket, but you decided to be high ticket. What was that skill set that you realized made you good at what you did and that allowed you to monetize it at a higher level compared to a lower level? Um, my ability to, to work in that space as a high, so while everyone else is focused on networking, mm -hmm. I focus on connecting huge difference. So I'll go to the networking event and the average person will go to the networking event with a stack of business cards or now their QR code and whatever. And they're working the room. They're trying to get as many connections as or, or as many contacts as possible. They Okay, there's 100 people in this room. I'm going to meet 70 of them. Mm -hmm. well, we're here for two hours. What valuable connection can you make with 70 people in two hours? I go to the networking event and I meet three people. You met 70, I met three. I connected. I talked. I spent time. So now when I follow up with you, because at these events, we always say what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Call me and let's you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you've been called and you're like, who? Oh, she had on a green dress. You don't remember anything else about her. When I call, it's, hey, Ariel, we were talking. Remember we sat down and we talked about our podcasting together. Oh, hey, Donnie, you know what's going on? Yeah, I wanted to invite you for lunch to see if we could talk. We said we would get together. My invitation and my next move goes further because I took the time to connect. Mm. Not just that, not just network. And that has carried me, and it goes back to my ability to communicate. Like, I believe that so many people fail to connect because they don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to say, or they're scared to say the wrong thing, or they just, you know, they, people are introverted. And I'm an introvert too, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I'm an extroverted introvert. I'm an introvert, but I promised myself that I would never let my shyness hold me back from opportunities. And that started in high school. I recognized that I, everybody thought I was like really outgoing and popular, but when it came time to like perform, I am cool in a crowd, but this one-on-one -on -one stuff, like first dates are, were always nervous for me. Auditions were, you know, nervous for me. Interviews, I'm, I'm really nervous, but I could go on a stage in front of a thousand people and show up. I, I never get nervous, mm -hmm. right? Um, I promised myself that I would not allow my shyness to prevent me from being great. You can't be great, shy and quiet. Somebody has to know that you're great. Yeah. You have to be able to communicate that. So 
well, you know, I understood that in business, business is about connections, access, sales. Connections, access, sales. If you can connect with people, you have a different level of access to sell them something over and over and over and over and over and over That's again. That's good. <laughs> that is really good. You, you said you were building a business for two years before you even took that exit. Mm -hmm. Did you leave? Like, did you have a D-Day or a destination day or did you like, peace, I'm okay. out of here. <laughs> um, so I was building in the network marketing space for two years. My property management company wasn't even six months old mm. when I quit. And again, I'm a feelings person. I can, it, it can go one way or the other with me. So you see me out, it can go one way or the other with me, right? Um, and that's just my background and my upbringing. I am super sweet until I'm not. And we'll leave it at that. Okay. Right? And so on my job, I think I had gotten tried one too many times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you had literally, it was like, okay, well, I had, you, they say F you money. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't even realize that I had it. Um, I didn't realize that I had F you money because, you know, I'm, I just, I'm getting money. I don't really know what's what I'm getting money, but I know I got enough money and it, I didn't really even care. I knew that I had enough money. I didn't know, you know, what the future would bring. I just knew again that I believe in my ability to figure it out. And so one day um, I walked into that job and I had to, you know, they they tried me again. And I said, you know what, just I'm going to just go ahead and give you my two day notice. And um, <laughs> I was thinking about you sharing that. My boss said, well, Donnie, I think you're being irrational and it's just completely inconsiderate for you to give us two days you know, to find a replacement. We were in the middle of this big audit. Mm -hmm. It's completely unreasonable, you know, for you to expect us to find coverage for you in two days. And I said, two days? <laughs> no, you heard me wrong. I mean, today. Like, today, you're going to notice that like, I'm out of somebody else for tomorrow <laughs> and beyond because I'm done. Yes. I am done. Mm -hmm. I am done. Um, and that was it. That was, I gave them my two-day notice. And, you know, it was funny because I heard someone else have a similar story in network marketing. They shared a similar story. And I remember looking at them like, man, I would love to be able to just be in a position to be like, F y'all, I'm out. Mm -hmm. And then not long thereafter, F y'all, I'm out. <laughs> it manifested. Honestly, it sometimes manifested. when you have a, that example of, of what it is that, or who it is that you want to be, now you can actually be that. Mm -hmm. The when you left, you went into solo entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. right? So, like, what were some of the things that you had to do or overcome in order to get to where you are? <laughs> um, the first thing that I had to overcome was structure that I was used to. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because in corporate America, your job is laid out. There's already SOPs. Yeah. You already know what has to be done. Your job is to come in here and do it. Yeah. You've been trained. You've got your handbook. This is the job that we need you to do every single day. And so structure was the very first thing that I had to release and rebuild. Yeah. Right. You don't have any in, in, in procrastination and laziness because when you first leave your job, every day feels like a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> And your first thing is a vacation. You don't have a job, girl. Let's hang out. And you're saying yes to all these brunch invites and invitations. And, you know, you will look around and you're like, dang, I've been brunching all month. <laughs> and waking up late. Yeah. So time management, structure, procrastination and laziness. Those were my mental enemies in the beginning. And then I had to catch a grip. Like I remember looking at my bank statement one month early on and like, dang. You spent more this month than you made in that job that you quit. Get it together before this ends. And for me, you know, I had um, I this wasn't my first time going out into entrepreneurship full time. Mm -hmm. Been there and done that. But because I had such a traumatic experience financially several years prior, I have a different relationship for money now. Right. Or a different respect for money and a different relationship with money. So because I already knew what it felt like to lose everything, I was determined to experience what it feels like to have more than enough, right? So 
I vowed and committed to, like if you see me shop and spending money, know your girl is getting money, right? Because I have a budget for how much I allow myself to spend at any given time. Um, so when I saw that I was brunching and eating and I saw my statement, I said, oh no, we're not doing this. We're not doing this because the only time I had that traumatic experience where I lost everything wasn't because I didn't make money. It wasn't because I grew up poor. It wasn't because I, I did that to myself because I spent every dollar that I made. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew enough from that experience to say, oh, we're not doing that again. We're going to save and put money up. And at that time, the thing was saving money. I didn't know anything about investing my money. Um, it, was, it was save, save, save. So those were the mental enemies and I had to course correct, course correct very quickly. And then, you know, it went from brunches with girlfriends to brunches with potential mentors or people who were in the digital space that I wanted to be in successfully and, you know, brainstorming and strategizing. And it came down to like masterminds with friends and that was the difference. I love it. You said mental enemies. Mm -hmm. It's literally you against you. And I yeah. think that um, understanding what those like tendencies are early on. My goal is to like try to help people understand what that is up front. But I don't know if it if um, not that I don't know. I believe if you notice what it is and create a practice then you can combat those mental en enemies even if life changes. Mm -hmm. And for you, you talk about affirmations, you talk about meditation, even like the Bob Proctor, uh, Magnet to Money, all of that stuff has been really helpful. When did you develop a practice, whether it was meditation, a religious or spiritual practice? 2012, and I know it because I can remember the person who introduced me to that life, <laughs> to that lifestyle. So I had a mentor uh, that I that I was blessed to come across in 2012 in the network marketing industry. And this person stood out from everyone else who was just there for the sale. It was just, you could just see him exude the habits of a person that you wanted to be. Mm. And it was like every room he stepped in, that room, like, I wanna be like this guy. Like, I wanna have not just that kind of money, but that kind of aura, that kind of impact, that kind of uh, effect on people. I want to be that great. The greatest belief coach that I've ever met in my whole life, the greatest belief teacher. And it's no, uh, it's no surprise that his mentor was also Bob Proctor, which was one of my mentors, um, because Bob Proctor was also one of the greatest belief coaches ever, right? Mm -hmm. So this person, you just, you didn't just see the money, even though they were a crazy multimillionaire, you saw the man and you're just like, how can somebody be this confident, this poised in tough times? How can they keep such great composure and how can they move a room the way that he moves this room? And so when you see someone who impacts you that way, you start to study them. I'm on your heels. I wanna know what you do. What do you do when you wake up? Like, what do you do when you wake up? Do you, how do you prepare for these calls that we have? Do you just say this stuff or are you, did you, saw, did you see it in a video somewhere? Like, what are you doing? And these questions would lead me to having more of an understanding because before that, all of the belief stuff, I can't remember really someone trying to teach me how important belief is um, and how important personal development is, but I promise I would have thought it was BS mm. until I saw it in action for myself, right? Because when people are looking for the keys to success, they're looking for an action step. They're not looking to change their inner being. Right. And a lot of times I talk about your mental enemies. Your enemy is your inner me. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the things that you believe about yourself are inside of you. The, the lazy person, the unqualified person, the person who's not ready yet, the person who doesn't have time. That's just you. That's you against you. Your enemy is your inner me. And so I would ask 
you know, this person, what do you do? And, and they started to teach it. Well, you know, I journal this way and I manage my calendar this way and I read this type of material and I only wear these type of clothes because it makes me feel this way. And as a result of every decision I make, this is why I make the decision. So it wasn't just someone telling, you got to journal, you got to meditate, you've got to have affirmations. It was for the first time having someone say, why putting these things in action will make a difference in your life and seeing it from a person that you respect so much because it's clear that whatever he's doing is working. Wow. That did it for me. That's amazing. I think that there are times when we could do the thing and you mm -hmm. feel like if you sit down and you meditate for five minutes, everything should be great. If I drink some water, I'll be awesome, right? But what you just said was the why mm -hmm. behind it and then the being, mm -hmm. right? We teach the things, but we don't teach the be. And I think that also like as you, you know, as I, as I get to watch you do your business or work your business and, and be who you are as a business coach, I definitely think that I, I think about, huh, how am I doing these things, right? Am I just turning on Bob Proctor just because I want to have it on? Or am I literally taking this stuff in? There was, there are times when you're much more clear and receptive to those things. Mm -hmm. And the, there are times when you're not. And you being receptive to this mentor is actually really, really dope. Mm -hmm. So over the course of your journey, right? And coming into yourself and recognizing different people who have wisdom and taking advice and seeing where it takes you. Uh, what have you learned about like mentorship that helps you kind of stay grounded and stay focused and be able to receive. Yeah. So mentorship is important to me. It's just as important as breathing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because I believe that we're constantly in a state of becoming. And when you're breathing, you're constantly in a state of living, which means that there's more life. And so you're, there's more becoming. What are you becoming? Who are you becoming? How are you becoming it? I believe everybody should find someone that they respect so much, as much as I respected my mentor of 2012 to maybe 2016, 2017, and still to this day, um, you find someone that you respect so much. It's somebody that in certain areas you would want to trade places with, right? I would want to trade my marriage for their marriage. I would want to trade my bank account for their bank account. I would want to trade their lifestyle for my lifestyle, their relationship with their kids for, you know, whatever that is and you listen and you soak it up and you be a sponge. People who are, who are qualified to mentor you have likely been through some things that you can learn and gain a lot of wisdom from. But also mentorship shows you what's possible. And because we're constantly in this state of becoming, Sometimes we're so focused on who we are that we forget or lose sight of what's possible. Mm. And so your mentor will always be the evidence of what's possible. And that's so important. It's like, you know, if you're driving somewhere and you know there's a dead end ahead, most of us would turn around, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we create these dead ends in our own mind. But that GPS is coaching us to our destination. No, 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 keep going. No, I know this turn looks weird. I know it looks <laughs> tricky over there, but keep going. It's your destiny. Where you're trying to go is right over there. Seriously, make that turn straight ahead. Bust the right. That's it. Trust me. But you would have stopped at the stop sign because it looks tricky up there. Mentorship should be an everyday thing, not something that you just do in this season, in this moment. Because there are people like what you said who... Um, sometimes you feel like you're getting to your destination when really what you're doing is just going through motions. Mm -hmm. You have the Bob Proctor on. Do I have Bob on today because I'm really ready to receive or do I have it on because somebody told me that I should do this every day and I just want to check off the fact that, yep, 30 minutes of Bob, right? 30 minutes of prayer, 30 minutes of personal development, 30 minutes of journey, whatever it is. Um, and mentorship and coaching holds you accountable. You can't fluff it with me. I know when you didn't do the work. 
Mm-hmm. Let's cancel today's call and try again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you chose to be a, um, a business coach in your space. And even what you produced uh, was really great from a business perspective. Do you ever see, because you've lived a lot of life and you've learned, right, from the life side of things as a woman, um, as a business owner, as, a, as an adult, right, as a mother, you've learned a lot about life. So in this next season of your life, do you see that you would ever package up a different experience that you know so well? and mentor others in that way? Uh, So I started before business coach because I wasn't qualified when I started coaching. I wasn't qualified to be anybody's business coach. That came over time. I started in the personal development space. So I too started in the space of teaching belief because it was something that I learned uh, to a degree where it started to lead to different success in my life. So I started in the personal development space um, and then it transitioned because that turned into a business for me. It transitioned into business But even as a business coach, I still do a lot of personal development. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I have a new program that will be releasing in a couple of weeks um, called Actionable CEO. Yeah, Actionable CEO is going to be a a membership group where we're focused on the whole CEO, Mm -hmm. not just the business, but the person, the woman, the man behind it, the mother, the father, the daughter, the sister, the significant other, like, tackling these real life issues because when you go into uh, settings with your coach or you go into conferences that teach you sales, that teach you marketing, there's not anybody there that they're going to teach you sales from this perspective, right? But there's not anybody there who's going to say, but if you're scared to talk to people, let's pull you to the side and really teach you how to get over that. Not just get through the script, but get over that trigger or that fear. And so Actionable CEO is an accountability group for CEOs that are designed to help you be better people, better humans, and better CEOs with actual actual action steps attached to it. So I am super excited about that. Um, It's all about making sure that you are taking the right action to live your life based on your own design. It's making sure that you're staying focused to your goal. It's you being in a community of other people who are, you know, some of us in desperate search in this journey of desperation to just be greater Mm -hmm. than anybody that we've been so far before. And so I'm really excited. Um, Actionable CEO is a revamp of what used to be Actionable Woman. Okay. I used to have uh, a group Actionable Woman and and the men just were not feeling it. Like, what's up? (laughs) I want to get in. I want to get in. Like you're helping and empowering all these women can we do this for the men too? And it used to be, you know, a really good experience. And this was obviously pre COVID where we could get together and do mansion sleepovers. Nice. And, uh, it was super cool. So I'm really excited uh, to see what actionable CEO does and my men, you know, better show up on this and not let me down. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the things that I think that um, would be really cool to talk through the business stuff and the revenue is awesome, but, I think a challenge and I'll say transparently is like as a woman trying to build a business on my own and like build my relationships or find the relationship that I want to build. And through your experience, like, would you say one of those things or what would you say was the thing that allowed you to navigate these like relationship streets while you were trying to elevate your empire? (laughs) Um, so, you know, I'm super focused on what I have to do. I just never felt like I had to sacrifice my desire to be fulfilled in a romantic space or in a romantic way. I I never felt like I had to sacrifice that to build my business. Mm -hmm. That's usually a thing that men go through, especially, right? They feel like they need to bring so much to the table. Let me get my business together before I be out in these streets. Now, when I was broke, when I lost everything, dating was something that I physically could not do because I felt like a liability. And so I needed to get back on my feet first before I before I dated. But when it comes to building business and navigating relationship, like I don't work all the time, contrary to popular belief. 
I have a lot of time available, right? I go through seasons. I go through seasons where I could be very, very busy. So if I had to be in a space where, you know, I someone finding a new relationship in that space, mm-hmm. that might not be the season for it. But mm-hmm. that's that spurts like a couple of months. We're not talking about years of not dating. It. I got to be touched and loved and hugged and kissed. Right. So um, I prioritize my relationship more than my business because that's my real life. That's my at the end of the day when I need people around me in my final moments, it won't be my laptop. Yeah. It's going to be my man and my kid and my parents or, you know, whoever. Um, So I prioritize those things. I will say, though, because I used to work in a space where I developed women specifically, the reason that I at that time focused on women is because women will lose themselves in relationships. You'll be single and you're motivated and you're working and you're out here beating down the streets, getting contracts and making money. And then you meet this man and suddenly you want to, oh, it won't hurt if I start my day two hours later today. Right. And then it's, oh, it won't hurt if I go on an extra vacation. Oh, it won't hurt if, you know, I rescheduled this client to go on dinner with my man because we get so excited and infatuated so quickly and emotional as women. I see women lose themselves in these new relationships and that's the problem. But that's not that's not a relationship versus business thing. That's a character thing. That's a flaw that you need to work on. Has nothing to do with the fact that you're building a business. It's just that you can get lost in a relationship very quickly. Yeah, I think that's the coolest thing about actionable CEO Mm -hmm. because we are focused on one thing and not realizing how your character is is affecting whatever your trajectory is. So it'd be really cool to see like just more people get holistically trained on being out in these streets because Mm -hmm. in these entrepreneurial streets because it's needed. And having those conversations like not just the training, there will be a lot of business, you know, development, Mm -hmm. but this is more so for the conversations like a group where I'm I'm, I'm presenting, like you said, in, in my program, it's like, how does she know this? I'm going to be talking about a lot of those how she know this scenarios mm-hmm. of what we're feeling and what we're expressing and things that people are scared to say, hesitant to say. They're not sure how it will be received by other people. I know all those thoughts been there, done that, had that. We're talking about these things and we're, we're figuring out and learning how to push through them so we can continue to take action in our businesses. I love it. I love it. Now, before we get out of here, I've heard the story many times, but I think that it would really, really like behoove people who who don't know you and don't know the decisions that you've made. Like you talk about decision making in a way that is um, it's it's embedded in everything you do. Right. And I think that your story on leaving corporate America to live this life is actually like really, really it's a turning point for a lot of people to decide what matters to them and then make a decision to choose themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you would feel free to like share any part of that story of how you realized you were going to leave, especially the story about your boss and and your daughter, like feel free to share a little bit of that. Yeah. um, That wasn't my last job, but it was an experience that kind of led to me understanding that this was my way out. Mm. Um, I worked on a job where at the time my daughter was small, she was young and, um, I needed to attend her school function, a, a graduation. And uh, I, <laughs> this was during the recession period. And I needed to attend this function. Now, I'm the number one person in the office. I generate all the sales and the most money and all this stuff. And I'm like, I need to be able to take this. Uh, I need to be able to get this day off to go to my daughter's graduation. And my boss at the time, my developer, the owner, not just my boss, but the lead, the head honcho. He's like, oh, you know, I'll talk to you when we get in, when I get in. Mm. He comes to the property. There's a helipad on top of the property and he lands in his little helicopter on top of the property girl. And he comes in the building with him and his son and their dog. And I'm sitting just like this. And I'm explaining to him that my direct supervisor has denied this opportunity for me to go to my child's graduation. And I need to talk to you. I I need to have this one on one with you and and I have to be there. 
and his son comes in. He's like, hey, dad, you know, how long are we going to be here? I want to get on the computer and play a game or something. Oh, we'll be going soon. He turns around. He's like, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm about to take the kid and the dog to Hawaii. In that moment, I felt so little. I am sitting here explaining the importance of me being at my daughter's school for this one time moment to a man that is about to fly his son to Hawaii for fun. I'm explaining how poorly I'm treated in the office and how disappointed my daughter would be if I weren't there. If she looked out and I weren't there. And meanwhile, you've got all this freedom. You call the shots. Nobody could ever tell you that you couldn't land on top of your own building, headed to a private airport to get to Hawaii. This will never happen to me again. This will never happen to me again. And I told him in that moment, hey, my developer was really nice, a really nice guy, but he was more so, well, whatever, you know, my supervisor said, whatever they say, they understand the coverage here better than I. And I said to him at the end of that conversation, like, hey, I get that you have a business to run, but I have a daughter to raise and I will be at her graduation. And whatever you guys feel like you have to do as a result of that is what you're going to have to do. And so it was so funny because, uh, I, of course, I went to her graduation. It just I wasn't scared. I didn't have any money. You know, I I did not care what happened, but I am a mother before anything else. Mm-hmm. I'm a woman and I'm a human and like you're going to respect me. I got stuff to do. And that's one thing about corporate America. Like you work Monday through Friday from nine to five. But every now and then something come up on a Tuesday at two and you have to do it. You are a human first. So I had to go where I was respected. Months later, um, it's time, you know, the recession is happening and we wake up literally one day and the economy has crashed and I go into the office and um, I didn't know honestly what had happened because I didn't watch the news until I went in the office and my developer was there and he said, well, Donnie, I got some good news for you and I got some bad news for you. I was like, what's up? Shoot it to me straight. He's like, well, the good news is you don't have to complain about not being able to spend this time with your daughter and needing time off and working super long hours, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get a lot of that time back. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really, what's the bad news? He's like, the bad news is because of what's going on in the world right now, we've got to close this operation down and I got to let you go. What? I didn't know what was going on. So I'm like, what's happening? He's like, have you been watching the news? I didn't know that the housing market crashed and, you know, all this stuff, but you know, he said it so calmly, like, I got to let you go. He wasn't being, you know, mean or anything. He's like, I just got to let you go. I hate to do it. But for him, there was no panic in his voice. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just a whirlwind of emotions. I'm panicking. How am I going to do anything now? Like, I'm just getting to the point where I can have all these experience at that time my daughter was like my only priority i'm just able to do all these things and Mm -hmm. she's in private school and you know all this stuff is going on and there was no panic in his voice and i panicked i panicked hard and then i realized i don't have that much money that was when i had to you know i had about six months worth of money saved and Mm -hmm. i had all this name brand of designer stuff and all this stuff that i had blown money on and during that point Nobody was buying it, not even at a consignment shop. I had all this stuff that meant so much to me that was worth nothing to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was the first like, okay, I got to get it together. And after that happened, me and a friend um, decided to open a clothing store. We started working uh, little by little to piece together this little clothing boutique in 600 square feet in Macon, Georgia. And... um, then that grew into me meeting someone else and I got involved in network marketing and then I met my mentor. And then when I met my mentor, it was up for there. My whole life mm. changed. Mm. I think that's amazing. When it comes to your story, I know you said before we started recording, you were saying like, listen, you know, I didn't have that like, you know, riches 
the rags and rags to riches story um, because you've constantly like been in situations where you've had uh, resources. It mm -hmm. wasn't like balling all crazy, but mm -hmm. you've had resources. And um, a lot of times we might look at people with like these sad stories and like you went from poverty to, to riches and we think, oh, they're different. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like they have something that I, they went through stuff that, that literally makes you successful, right? But as you tell the story, I understand what you mean by like everything was you like you life, even though the environment was set up for you to be comfortable, your ebbs and flows mm -hmm. were brought on by part of part of things that you can't control. But other things were like you and your behavior and your decision. decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up on the lower end of middle class. Mm -hmm. Right. There's like middle class. It's like you're you're right here kind of middle class or you're all the way up almost high class i grew up kind of on the low to medium end of middle middle class if that makes sense so that means that we had the house and mm -hmm. my parents had new cars and i went to the nice schools i dressed nice had all my toys. we had everything we needed my parents provided for me um one thing though that especially my mom both my parents but especially my mom uh, I watched her get me in all these programs that I didn't really qualify for, right? I didn't qualify for these programs. I didn't do whatever the prerequisites were to be there, but my mom was able to walk me into these situations because she communicates well too. Um, and then I always fell into that space where these programs that she would want me involved in, either we made too much money or we didn't make enough money to afford it, right? Mm -hmm. So that was my upbringing. I I don't believe, I know because I've done it, you don't need a trauma story to turn around and be successful. All you need is a desire to want more, mm -hmm. like at any level. It's like billionaires have children who look at their parents with such disdain because of how they got the money sometimes that they make. We see this, it's not just a, a story on TV, we see it how you got the money is so disgusting and so despicable. And then they go on and they become successful based off of the disdain for how their parents created and built a legacy. So they go out and they do something completely different and they too become successful. You have people who come from almost nothing, who want more and they desire more and they go out and they become successful. You have people who, like me, I learned how to be resourceful from my mom and dad. Like I learned, my mama was going to figure it out, honey. She, you, you want to go to what program? Done. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, this is where she needs to be to get the done. And I don't think she gives herself to this day enough credit for that, but I inherited that, that trait from her. And again, I grew up middle class. The, the, the phases in my life where I was broke, dead, broke, poor, were on me. I did it. Like, I actually had food stamps at one point in my life. It didn't have nothing to do with my childhood upbringing. I did that. These were my decisions, right? But I do know that I also made the decision that I would fix this. I would correct this. It was important for me to distance my daughter so far from the memory of us financially suffering that she doesn't even really remember it, and she doesn't. She doesn't even really remember it, right? She remembers little moments, but she doesn't remember the splitting of the Wendy's value meals. And my goal, like I just couldn't do it. My mom didn't allow me to be to suffer, to be homeless, to be in houses, you know, in in the home with no utilities turned on and mm -hmm. and my decisions had me and my daughter in that situation and I was disgusted with myself. And I said, "You know what?" My daughter, it, this changes now. It was just, this, this changes now. I just had this epiphany. And it, it, in that moment, I'm like, my daughter will never have to look beyond me for what a woman is supposed to be. And I have lived with that all these years. My fear was to disappoint her to the point where when she grew up and someone asked her who her role model was or where she got her whatever from, my name would never be mentioned. Mm. Biggest fear, biggest fear. So I had to course correct, course correct immediately. And then second was because I knew, like growing up, I thought we had money. All my friends would come to my house. I had all the toys, all the everything. And I thought we had money. It wasn't until I got older that I realized 
we didn't have money. My parents risked and sacrificed and, you know, made sure that I wasn't touched by whatever the grown folks were being um, touched by, you know, whatever they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so second for me was because once I became a parent, I realized like, man, they really sacrificed. I understand now what had to happen for me to do this. I could not let my parents' hard work to figure it out for me be in vain. Your hard work paid off, mama. <laughs> like, it paid you. off. <laughs> and the champion she was literally made the champion that sits here today. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There's something that you said um, that I really think that is the pinnacle of kind of like where a lot of people are in their life. They're looking down a path and maybe looks like there's a dead end, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily know how they're going to get past it or they don't trust themselves to move a little bit forward. So before we get out of here and this, hopefully it's not too big of it. I think you can literally close this out really, really nice because I think there's someone who is not sure of, you know, what's to, what's to come. They feel like there's more, right? They know that they're destined for more. Um, but they haven't yet continued down that path, especially for those who are in corporate America, they're already making their six figures. There's no real reason, right. To like do anything outside of, you know, the same day to day. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person who is destined for greatness and just doesn't know how to move forward? Move like you have to move. So to know and not to do is not to know. So people will say often, I used to hear this all the time, like, yeah, I'm just going to stay on my job. Like, I know I could be doing such and such, and I know exactly what I need to do to make it successful. I'm just, I'm comfortable with my six figures. Well, you knowing exactly what to do to achieve the level of success that you dream of and not doing it is the exact same as a person who has that same dream and they don't know anything to do. You're the same, mm -hmm. right? So you actually have to take an action uncertainty is a part of life there is no sure path there is the only sure path that we're on is death it's coming one day in terms of what you may encounter along your journey how difficult it may be there's no way to really really gauge that but aligning yourselves with mentors and coaches can make that journey a little bit easier you just have to keep going and go through it the beauty about what's happening right now is that there aren't too many new ideas. Whatever you're thinking you want to do has been done before. And so I would encourage you to find people who have done it before and kind of follow the, the path that they took to get there. That can provide a little bit more clarity. That can give you a little bit more certainty. You can be a little bit more sure by following a blueprint that has already been laid out, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Sometimes we are in our heads and we think our ideas are so unique that there's nobody else in my lane. It's a bunch of people in your lane. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of people in your lane. You have to do what's called market research. You have to understand what the goal is and you do some research and spend some time and you see, oh, there's actually 12 other people doing this. Let me study and reverse engineer how they did it and I can do something similar. Um, and for those of you who feel like you're making money and there's no real urgency, the fact that you only have that one job and that stream of income is the urgency. When we're thinking about corporate America, like I respected corporate America for what it did. I learned so much in corporate America and I'm putting things in place so that one day my business operates at the same level, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the riskiest thing a grown person can do in their lives is to rely on this good money that another human being is paying them. Because now it's saying that I put all of my trust in the dreamer's dream. What if that CEO one day comes in and says, shut, shut the whole thing down? Hmm. What if like me, there's a world change that directly in, impacts your industry and one day you're on top, one day, the next day you're suffocating under all of the rubble, rubbish. Those things can happen. 
and it is the most irresponsible and scariest thing that would keep me up at night knowing what I know now about life it would keep me up knowing I only have one source of income and I, as an entrepreneur even mm -hmm. I had to grow le grow legs and multiple streams of income because it is so frightening to lay in bed when you when you when you know loss when you've experienced loss it's so frightening to say oh my god I only make money this one way what if something happens to it I encourage every single person you don't have to be full-time in entrepreneurship. You don't have to leave your job. You may love your job, but you do need to diversify the way in which you generate money. You do need to uh, diversify the way in which you have access to resources that allow you to build something bigger because it's not just for you. And generally, the type of audience that you have watching this podcast, mm -hmm. they're good people who absolutely want to leave something for the people who influence their lives, the people that they love, whether they have kids or family or whoever that is. I don't think this audience is just in it for themselves. And when you're on a job, you're in it for yourself. Just on a job, you're in it for yourself. The day you quit, the day you die, the day you're fired, the checks stop coming. You have to build something for yourself that can outlive you and continue to serve the people that you love that are still behind when you're far gone. That's what I do it for. Mm, did you guys hear that? If you didn't, I need you to go ahead and get your notepad, your pen and your paper. Take a note. Because honestly and truly, I don't know how I would have gotten my legs in entrepreneurship it was, if it wasn't for that perspective. Mm -hmm. So guys, do what you need to do. Take a note, pause this, replay it. <laughs> <laughs> and do what you guys have to do. Now for those who are listening mm -hmm. and they, are, um, they know they're destined for greatness, mm -hmm. they want to either connect with you, they want to work with you, or they want to be an actionable CEO. How can they connect with you, Ms. Donnie? Yeah, um, so a couple ways. One, find me on Instagram. I am at Donnie Wiggins underscore. And I, I'm sure it'll be on the video. Yes, description. absolutely. Okay, great. And then you can connect with me for wherever you are in your business. I have programs for beginners, for transitioning uh, corporate employees. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have higher level programs for people who are also in entrepreneurship that are trying to get to the next level. You can just go to uh, sixfigureedu.com, S-I-X, figure, E-D-U.com, um, forward slash links. And that will give you all of the options there. You kind of look around there and see exactly what you need. And check us out on uh, my podcast, The Social Proof Podcast. Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing resource for entrepreneurs who are looking for uh, that one key. Because sometimes that's all it is. Sometimes you just need to hear that one thing. I said something today to somebody. Yes. One thing. Yes. That said, let me get up and let me let me get this together. And that's all you need. So check me out. Sixfigureedu.com forward slash links. Instagram, Social Proof Podcast. Wonderful. Donnie, thank you so much for being a blessing to individuals, yeah. to masses. Thank you for continuing to be yourself and unfolding different parts of yourself and allowing us to like learn from that. You. Amazing. And I'm so proud of you. I'm <laughs> so you. proud of you. This is awesome. You guys, Ari Ariel is doing her thing and stay connected to her because she is going places, places, places. Like I just know where your journey started. Um, and to see that you actually so many people say, I am going to accomplish this goal. I'm gonna do a thing. And you came out here and you didn't like tiptoe in it. You were astute from day one. You got the key that you needed mm -hmm. and you went full steam ahead. Period. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Listen, you guys heard it. Just attach yourself to people who are doing exactly what they need, what they say mm -hmm. they're going to do. And you guys will be on your path. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for watching. Until next time. Peace out. Bye.